a greetings to you all and welcome to our sharing about the encyclical recently released by Pope Francis on the feast of St. Francis of Assisi, Fratelli Tutti. We have developed these series of conversations and panels here at the Diocese of Saskatoon to help us all engage in the document. The, this social encyclical is a great work of Pope Francis, which comes to us at a very important time in the church and in the world. I hope that you will enjoy the conversations, the perspectives, and the sharing of our various panel members. And uh, we hope also it will generate some ongoing discussion in your families and in your church communities and beyond. So please enjoy and welcome to these panel discussions. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and it's good to be here to uh, reflect on the Holy Father's most uh, recent encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, uh, which was released on October 4th. It was written for October 3rd, but released on the feast day of St. Francis of Assisi, October 4th of this year. And uh, to reflect on a couple of uh, topics and questions, uh, there are three people with me. And uh, why don't we begin with the person on my right and work across. Perfect. I'm Celine Seren, and I'm a teacher at Bishop James Mahoney High School in Saskatoon. I primarily teach uh, French Catholic studies courses for them over there. Um, and it's my first year there, but I'm really enjoying it. So I'm hoping to bring a little bit of the teacher perspective to some of these thoughts here. Thanks, Celine, and good to have you with us. And Sister Martha. Hello, my name is uh, Sister Marta. I belong to a missionary community called Verbunde, and uh, I recently arrived here to the diocese. Very happy to be here and uh, serve the Word of God uh, now here in Canada, in Saskatoon. How do you like all our snow? Oh, wonderful. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. It's good to hear that. Okay. Benvenuto. Mi chiamo Padre Stefano Penna. My name is Father Stephen Penna. And I am the rector at St. Paul's Co Cathedral and a long time uh, student of uh, the writings of the Holy Father. So, this was a very good occasion to go back and explore again the depth of the gift that God makes to us in Papa Francesco. Well, thank you. Thank you all very much. And thank you for agreeing to be here today. And, uh, well, why don't we begin with our, our first reflection question? And, um, the first reflection question deals with uh, the early part of the encyclical, uh, actually chapter four, uh, titled The Illusion of Human Dignity and Communication, Challenging Challenges and Opportunities for Evangelization. And um, the question maybe uh, we can reflect on is uh, the encyclical cites many ways in which communication and relationship with others is an even greater challenge today. A noun made even more urgent with the COVID-19 pandemic. What issues come to mind for you, and how does the new encyclical suggest a response? And who would like to begin with a reflection? I'll leap in. Thanks. The Pope writes powerfully, prisoners of a virtual reality, we lost the taste and the flavor of the truly real. We're in a perilous situation. The Holy Father is saying that while we have a chance of making connections, our young people certainly operate on this platform of virtual reality, there's a great danger. And the danger is that of deepening the technocratic, technological control of economy, which in turn, according to the Pope, controls the, uh, controls the economic forces, which in turn controls politics, which in turn controls people. He calls for a creative openness so that we use this technology if possible but always at the service of real persons because the screen alienates us from real connection it keeps us at a distance and in our schools and in our communities we really put a lot of emphasis on computer literacy he's calling for love literacy a kind of a charity of social friendship. And so I, in the pandemic time, perhaps our experience of the pain of not being able to be with people, of discovering that if we only have virtual relationships, life is not exactly full. 
Yes, I, your, your comments, Father Stephen, and as I read the part of the, the section that keeps coming up about the use of technology, the, 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 uh, the question, what is the tool, the technology or the person? <laughs> and the Holy Father is certainly uh, highlighting that in many, many ways. Um, Sister Marta. Yes, um, I listening to you and also reading the encyclical, uh, I think what really comes to, to my mind is the need to rethink to ourselves and the relation, how we relate and communicate to others, that this really may improve the, the quality of our relationship. But really it's um, very important uh, to um, have in mind that, uh, that we, uh, we are part of uh, a single family, a human great family, without which, uh, as you are saying, Father Pena, we will not be able to understand fully each other. And I think that this is a, a challenge, but at the same time, an opportunity, mm -hmm. like uh, the double uh, uh, face of the coin, mm -hmm. we will say, because uh, it's precisely in today's world, uh, it says it's beautiful, this number 48 uh, of the encyclical, that uh, this world is um, largely death, yeah. not just la death, largely death, which really uh, the Pope makes us aware of, about uh, in our relationships, in, in the com communication, the importance really uh, for us as human to live with others, to welcome each other, to um, have, um, accepting the other. And, uh, but this, uh, we live in a world, even though we are in a pandemic moment, that is accelerated. There's this, uh, like, uh, how in English they say, frenetic pace, mm -hmm. this, this word, that this prevents us to listen to each other in um, an attentively way. It's really what the other is, is saying to me. And so really, I find beautiful the Pope here really awakens us this fact that to have a good communication and good relationship, we cannot really um, lose our capacity to listen. Mm -hmm. And uh, of, as you were saying, this um, the digital connectivity, he's very clear in that, no? can't substitute, can't substitute mm -hmm. our relationship made of uh, really um, physical gesture, uh, trembling, uh, all this uh, thing, body language. Mm. And in that sense, really, mm, I find uh, nowadays, uh, well, in my country, but in, this is, I think, universal. Also, in our conversation, uh, we text, voice text message. Uh, we, that's it's very common. And really, that breaks mm -hmm. uh, the, the conversation in many, in many moments. So really, uh, I find that uh, very challenging, how the, the Pope uh, challenged us in, uh, to cultivate uh, silence, uh, silence uh, and listening. This capacity of li because if we are able to listen to each other, then we can uh, seek together the truth. Uh, well, th thank you. I, it's interesting, uh, your comments on the Pope's uh, focus on relationship and the call to true connectivity. It's something that he, he certainly introduced a lot in Laudato Si on yes. our common home, and it certainly comes up uh, very much in this encyclical. So thank you, Sister Marta. Celine, as a teacher, uh, you interact with high school and elementary school students much. You must have uh, some thoughts about uh, our topic here. Yeah, and even listening to the two of you speak, it came back to me again, the idea that I really focused on was this idea of having a throwaway culture. So, you know, we mentioned this frenetic pace, um, this, this sense of always urgency. You know, what is the next? What is the next? Let's move on. Does this have value to me? No, moving on. And the Pope mentions many a time that we have a tendency now not only to do this to objects, but we're doing it to people, we're doing it to their opinions, mm -hmm. and what it's doing is it's, it's creating these bubbles. And we're able to live our lives where, you know, we sort of protect our own bubble. We're making sure that it doesn't pop. And by doing so, what we're doing is we're closing off ourselves to a, 
a plethora of different opinions that, in fact, would enrich our lives. And you mentioned that in terms of relationship, sister, that in bringing in these other opinions and in exposing ourselves to the difference, if we're actually able to live with that silence, live in that bit of discomfort, what we will find is that we can grow together as that one human family. And so I thought it was really interesting that he brought this idea up, and especially in the schools, is you see this sense of, you know, needing these objects for sure, but you also see it in how sometimes the students interact with one another in their chosen groups of friends with some mm -hmm. tendencies towards exclusion, is there are these notions of what serves me right now and what reflects my views, what reflects my opinions, and then therefore what doesn't. And so it really creates an us and them, and what the Pope is inviting us to do is rather to see the universal us, to take down those walls and to really listen in order to create that real encounter. Well, thank you, Celine. And, and uh, uh, you, you spoke about the, I guess, what he also calls the polarization, the, the, the bubbles of people that we, we end up at, uh, attaching ourselves to and, and therefore not... Uh, Connecting with others and uh, connecting with others again is a big uh, theme and so maybe that leads to the next issue and that's the church's call to deal with the stranger in a global and polarized world and uh, so maybe the, the question here we can uh, comment on is uh, the encyclical is prophetic and challenging regarding the increasing isolation, isolation and polarization of groups of people in our local and global setting. What stands out for you as the greatest challenge or challenges given the context here in Saskatoon? I know Sister Marcia, you're relatively new here, but maybe you could hear uh, the other two speak first and speak to this from your experience coming from Rome and, uh, and what you're kind of finding here as you arrive in your first month here in Saskatoon. Who would like to? You want to start us off, Celine? Um, so here I really focused on this idea of control, and so I, I'm finding this um, is quite, I guess, typical of this pandemic situation is this need for control within all of us. And so part of how we try to strive for this control is, again, keeping our groups quite small. Mm -hmm. um, what it's doing is it's cutting us off, but it's giving us this false sense of, of being safe because we don't have to live in this uncomfortable situation. So what we're finding now is, especially because we can't have these large gatherings, is we're having an even heightened sense of having a very similar group of people. Therefore, they reflect, again, our opinions. And what came to mind as I read this was the need for vulnerability in all of this. Um, vulnerability is hard, okay? but it, it allows for true dialogue. And part of vulnerability is admitting that you don't have all the answers, is showing a side of yourself that opens you up towards the potential critique or comments of others in an effort to grow. Um, when we look at the situation in the world in terms of Black Lives Matter, this was a point that really spoke to me, is there is this need of vulnerability amongst society, right, is this idea of, I don't have all the answers, but I'm here to journey. And I'm open to what may come at me in terms of criticism, uh, in terms of points of growth, but it is in taking that criticism or in taking those points of growth that I'm able to continue on my journey and seek those opportunities for encounter outside of perhaps my typical bubble. Thanks, Selena. As you were speaking about uh, about the, the various groups and the Black Lives Matter, etc., I was reflecting on the Pope's comments on the Good Samaritan parable, and he has a, a very potent line that I know shook me a bit too. It was belief in God and the worship of God are not enough to ensure that we're actually living in a way that pleases God. You know, like our liturgy um, proclaims how we are God's holy people in the world. And, uh, and it affirms, it in blesses, it invites us through our worship uh, to that encounter, that relationship, which can be a wonderful and also at times challenging and even scary thing as we face 
the call to vulnerability. Yeah, thanks. Father yes, Stephen. the parable of the Good Samaritan sort of anchors his way of engaging this. And it does challenge a kind of religiosity that the Pope last Sunday called, on the World Day of the Poor, called the faith that lives for rules. And he says, we are rather called for a faith, faith that lives for risk. That we must be people who risk, as did that Samaritan about going out and actually encountering. It was, you see, the Pope pointed us on Sunday, and he points us in here to the place that we have to be vulnerable to, where the good news of God awaits, and that is in the poor, in the marginal. The Pope on Sunday said, the one guy with the talents should have put his money in the bank. And he says, where is the bank today? It's the poor. Okay. The call here, and it's very difficult for us fat, mediocre Canadians, maybe I'm speaking about myself, <laughs> the, that we're very comfortable, and we live in a church that can be in, institutionally self-secure. It's not anymore. We're being ruptured inside and out. The work of the Holy Spirit is now calling us to a new place of risk. risk. And while the tendency would be to start looking inside, and becoming polarized within. The Holy Father is continuing the social teaching of the church to saying we must attend to the poor. This is a comment that comes from the margins. Ours is a pope from the margins. When he was elected, the first thing he said to the church that the cardinals had ca called quasi al fine del mondo, almost from the end of the earth, the pope, and he's been that. He's a migrant to Italy. He doesn't really belong to Europe. And he certainly does not belong to North America, which annoys a lot of North Americans because we are used to only hearing our words about the people on the margin. We're not used to listening to people on the margins. He's from the margins and he's calling us to a fundamental institutional and life vulnerability that for me, who wants to now cruise into, no, I don't want to cruise into retirement. You see, he's calling us to a radical kind of risk. So we have to go out to young people who are marginalized and their cultures. Here in Saskatoon, practically immigrant Catholics coming in in great numbers. And we just want to blend them into our, into, and integrate them into our community without listening to their stories. Here in Saskatoon, we have priests that come to service from other parts of the world. How much do we have real connection with their countries, beyond the kind of mercenary communication of sending money and resource back and forth. The Holy Father is calling us to a larger level. He says it's vitally important that we know our neighborhoods, that we live as a people, you know, and we should therefore revision our parishes. What does it mean to be neighborhoods who love the land and who know people who have an identity? And he gestures to a very great gift that Saskatoon has, and that's the Monastery of St. Peter's. He points in his encyclical to the example of the Benedictine tradition of hospitality. Now that is one of the essences of who we are, by God's grace, in the Diocese of Saskatoon. And we have to, we are called to, that constant risk of being hospitable. And it's not easy to have people come into your culture and into your room, especially when they want to start rearranging the furniture. So we have to know what's the important furniture to have, and then maybe let them move to different ways. But the fundamental call is to the poor. That is the place that our transformation, that is about, and it will be on account of what we have done for the poor that we will be meeting our God. He's not going to ask us how the bell is sounded from St. Paul's. Thanks, Father Penna. The, uh, as you were speaking about, uh, you covered many, many issues there. And as you were speaking about our, 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 some of our brother priests who come from other countries, um, one of the gifts of their coming to us is to challenge us from the perspective of the so-called stranger. Um, about some new insights about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission mm. and how we 
um, engage in true reconciliation between Indigenous and uh, non-Indigenous peoples. And uh, uh, they're giving us a sort of a fresh perspective because they, they have and still are going through their own uh, situation of, of, of having a, a post-colonial history and all that that means and the call to forgiveness, the call to confronting issues of, of truth and true relationship from a Catholic Christian perspective. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot there. Thank you. Welcome. Well, Sister Marta, as a newcomer to Canada, uh, you've seen many other parts of Canada, uh, par uh, pardon me, other parts of the world, and uh, and given the charism of Verbum Dei, which has its own uh, uh, focus on uh, hospitality and uh, dwelling with God's word in the silence in order to be in relationship, uh, you must have a, a perspective on this issue. Yes, uh, well, thank you. It helps me to listen to you and also about my experience in reading this encyclical. Uh, really, actually, the first thing uh, that came to my mind was, uh, who is the stranger, who is the vulnerable that us, uh, as church, we are called to deal with? Uh, because also the Pope really uh, clearly states that everybody, every brothers and sister that uh, is in need, becomes an existential, uh, an existential foreigner, even though born in the same country. Mm. And this really uh, caught the attention because a stranger in uh, vulnerable, in uh, coming close and supporting, in, uh, uh, says uh, here, in taking care, is not rather a geographical issue, but is an existential issue. Yes. This is very, really very profound uh, because it, that's why it's so important to become aware of this dynamics of whom and what uh, gets inside or uh, outside. Uh, but um, there in the parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, in that sense, really the Word of God, uh, uh, beautiful because it gives us this lesson of life. Uh, we can do good and not be good. Mm. We can do good things uh, even pray, okay, and not be fraternal with the ones uh, that are at our hand. And that's why really I found that challenging uh, this call to become neighbor of all, which the Pope speaks about this daily effort uh, that we need, uh, really, uh, and in our pastoral, pastoral care, really the importance uh, to not step in a logic of assistance. That... Uh, would be really reductive, uh, but uh, um, and also in the logic of our own uh, interests. Uh, but this uh, really to seek for this fraternal society that ensures, uh, uh, enables, as a diocese, uh, really that everybody can bring out their their best, even though says the Pope, uh, uh, really uh, that their performance may be less than optimum, mm. but. Re really, um, yes, so m many, many things, you know, but I guess that this proposal uh, of uh, recognizing ourselves as neighbors uh, to the others uh, leads us to a pastoral work uh, that should not be uh, focused uh, just on celestial matters, uh, but that really, because uh, w w we can help teach uh, how to pray, how, how, how to work, uh, um, but uh, sometimes the, the person um, can pray, acknowledge uh, uh, this, um, uh, how you say, social problems, and yet is not involved. As a Christian, is not involved, is not connected uh, uh, with the other. Yeah pass by the real needs of, um, of reality. That's why the importance of an integral spirituality, of uh, that intimacy with God, but that leads us to, uh, to our neighbors, to, to the others, in this capacity, really, that uh, helping each other to be involved and committed uh, to the other. Thank you, Sister Marta. A, uh uh, the latter part of your reflection made me think about uh, a few comments I've heard that people find the genius or one of the geniuses of the encyclical is is um, linking the particular to the universal. 
So, I mean, and there's problems when we're too particular. Uh, we can get in our own, as you mentioned, Celine, in our own little bubble or tribe. Um, but if we're too universal, we're, we're not relating to the particular person, especially the stranger. Um, so I, I'm wondering a, a next issue that maybe we can reflect on very briefly is maybe drilling down a little bit more into the themes of encounter and relationship that come up in the encyclical. And um, are there any particular themes or issues that the Pope raises in the encyclical on friendship and encounter that are opportunities in your pastoral or school or ministerial context that you'd like to raise? I think for me what stood out was the emphasis on human dignity mm -hmm. and it, it comes back throughout the encyclical. He refers to it often and it's something that I've seen in my own teaching experience mm -hmm. is the necessity to really go back to what this teaching is. Um, society has such a different view on dignity than the, than the church does and uh, I find it often surprises my students when we dive into this, the idea that it belongs to them inherently. Mm -hmm. By virtue of being part of the creation of God, it belongs to them. You don't earn it like a gold star. You don't lose it like a gold star. And therefore, it needs to be appreciated throughout. And it, and it elicits a lot of good conversation among us because it really breaks down this idea they have in their head of these bubbles that they have and can maintain. And it really causes them to question, well, on what basis have I created this? On what basis have I made these decisions of who's on the outside and who's on the inside? Mm -hmm. And who am I to decide what I saw as undignified or what I saw as less worthy? And so it creates a questioning in the students. And what I found, too, is if we're able to start everything there, then showing them these opportunities for celebrating the differences, mm -hmm. for soaking up the silence, for not shying away from the uncomfortable, it becomes so much more clear to them because they are able to see that although someone may be different, we are both dignified because of our role in the creation and we're able to go and we're able to look at that and say, not only do we have this dignity, thanks by the grace of God, you know, but it makes it necessary that there be different reflections of God. So it shows them, you know, here's the reason for this difference, and here's the reason for the appreciation of the difference. And so it helps them step out of that, hopefully, in, a, in an age, especially at that teenager, you know, adolescent yeah. phase, mm -hmm where staying inside and being safe and finding that belonging has so much importance that maybe otherwise they wouldn't have the courage to step out of. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Father Penn, I, I, I'm kind of struck with, uh, you've had quite a journey. You've been involved in academia for a long time, and, uh, and, and, and now you're uh, involved in rigorous pastoral ministry yes. in the downtown parish in the biggest city in Saskatchewan. And, and you're still uh, very much involved in, uh, in pulling from your, 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 your background of, of uh, Catholic higher education and bringing that to bear in practical ways in pastoral ministry. So uh, th there must be much in this for you. Oh, it was a great challenge to return again to uh, explore social teaching of the church. This is a, the, two things. Number one, this isn't written for the church, particularly. And that's very important to understand this. This is a letter from the Pope mm -hmm. to people of goodwill. Now that's a very important thing. Otherwise you get all mis mixed up in all of this. And he's a Jesuit. Because Jesuits know how to have a conversation. And he is presenting from the margins, in a propositional way, the teachings of the church mm -hmm. to respond and offer to people of goodwill, those who do not know Jesus, the richness that comes from living at this new moment of a birth of communion. The world is at a time of great transition. We have moved from the tribalism to, to the dignity of the individual, from tribe to individual. 
But now there are two dangers that he always attacks. Tribalism, inward looking, and individualism. Because these are the dis these are the diabolic, and he uses that word, ways of distracting from the call to community, which is an image of the Holy Trinity, of living in a community. Now this sounds a little bit abstract, but when you dig underneath it, it's hard to read his writing because he comes from a different way of engaging the world. He's a chemist, and as a chemist, the, the image that he uses throughout his papacy, and even before, his favorite image is a polyhedron. He presented that to the European communi uh, community, and he said, what is that? It's a linkage of facets that are beautiful and wonderful in their own right, but they make no sense unless they're linked to a real whole. And so he's always able to negotiate the particular because he experienced in Argentina the crush of American and military destruction of local dignity and, and communities and the reality of, of the universe. The world is not abstract. It's not our thinking about the world. And so the thing that really strikes me in all of this is that the Holy Father is deeply challenging us to be able to develop that kind of language of faith that goes to others. However, there's been a reaction against this encyclical, and I like to talk about this. A lot of faithful Catholic people have been led by commentators to dismiss this as globalist, as the Pope's a dupe, he's simply fitting into it. This is all the stuff and bother of, Amer of the American empire collapsing. And that's their perspective. That is a wrong perspective. It doesn't understand what the Holy Father is bringing. He's saying, there is only one way. It's absolutely clear. The church is not an NGO. We're not in the business of abstract things, of affirming other ideas on their own. We have the message of Jesus Christ. And without Jesus Christ, none of this is possible. Without Christ Jesus, there is no possibility of communion. And it's from that confidence that he leads forth and challenges. And so the fundamental call for us that undergirds all of this is a re-engagement of the social justice engage, uh, teaching of the church, which for a time, when I was younger, I'm older than you guys, got us distracted from being with, with Jesus and focused more on the kind of justice doing. But now it's a call to really see that meeting Jesus leads us to real action. Thank you. You you covered a lot of ground. With Too much reflection. No, no, no. Uh, another thing that came to mind uh, as you reflected on on how it's easy to react to Pope Francis and what he's doing, and and that it's too social or socialist focused, if I could use that phrase. Um, I, I I think I've shared with some of you that uh, I, I see this reflection and. This, you know, obviously God-appointed pope uh, is carrying on the work of the previous popes, Absolutely. and uh, and John Paul II, you know, he uh, he was the pope that saw the the fall of the Iron Curtain and was indeed personally instrumental in the fall of the Iron Curtain, and he was known and was heard to say, you know, I'm grateful for the fall of godless communism, but I'm very concerned about what will replace it because godless capitalism and consumerism is every bit as bad as godless communism. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, decades later, we come to this point where we have Pope Francis kind of carrying on that theme in a new context, given you know, his own skills and, and perspective in a world where uh, uh, you know, godlessness is rearing its uh, face in many, many ways and uh, in many isms. <laughs> so... Uh, do you have any reflection on, in the midst of all of this, the call to relationship and friendship? Yes, I think that uh, relation and friendship and this building encounter and relationship uh, has its roots uh, in the social dialogue uh, 
the social dialogue for a new culture that the, the Pope speaks about. And I think we need to purify, again, our idea of a dialogue, uh, not just intended, uh, as uh, he, he says, uh, this uh, uh, exchange of opinions, yes. uh, yeah. <laughs> right? That are merely, merely parallel monologues. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but raises up this important for this genuine uh, dialogue, uh, open to other, not in function of ourselves, uh, because it's true, here we are speaking about uh, our human family. It's not just uh, just Christian or other religions, but it's really, it's wide, uh, the, the range. And uh, uh, really how to see, um, to build a culture of encounter. I mm -hmm. find this very, needs a lot of time to discuss and reflect yes. on, because it's very, it's very important, uh, and we can't get for guarantee that uh, yeah. uh, we are part of a, of a whole, uh, and uh, it's not just uh, us as a sum uh, uh, of people acting, but uh, uh, really this um, uh, seeking these points of uh, of commune of of, uh, of community that. Is what really builds bridges, and that he said many beautiful, beautiful things. things yeah. I can't really yeah. about kindness, about even the importance. I think that's very challenging even in education to um, start anew from truth. We need to young yes. people. Uh, we can't ignore the past, but uh, he speaks about this penitential memory, which mm -hmm. doesn't mean to lo look back in time, but to accept what we experience, uh, that's the way how we can encounter again each other in order that uh, the past doesn't cloud uh, the future, mm -hmm. he says. No? So I found that very important uh, and uh, how uh, this uh, um, walking, uh, starting a new uh, uh, from truth uh, has this, uh, he calls them companions, uh, I say like keychains uh, of uh, mercy and justice mm. where again what uh, you were saying selena is really but justice uh, the clearness that at, at the center there is the the human person uh, and uh, the um, looking for the common good not just uh, my own uh, uh, returning and mercy so anger is un unhealthy for us you know and really i think that what leads us uh, to have then uh, a profound, uh, a peaceful conscious uh, and a, a deep joy in trying to uh, come together mm. in that listening again to each other in this constructive dialogue. Mm. You know, uh, the, the, your reflections on the Pope's reflection on truth mm. and uh, how we move forward. Uh, I was really struck by uh, the statement that he made about uh, a forgiveness is not pretending nothing happened. It, mm. it, it, uh, we yes. remember what's happened in order to move forward. And in our remembering, you know, um, God helps us to confront the past, to, to acknowledge what happened, and move forward. Uh, you know, and, and he implies in that, I know he does, uh, with Christ's help and healing. And uh, that's a part of ongoing conversion. Uh, it's a part of the true healing. And that's something where our world is so stuck, uh, I feel, and, and I sometimes have to watch that in myself, too, is, is you know, uh, to, to realize true forgiveness and reconciliation. Big theme in Canada, but it's becoming a big theme in the world, you know. Uh, how do we not get stuck? No, uh, and, in fact, no, he says uh, forgive uh, doesn't mean that we don't forget, mm -hmm. and yet we can still forgive. As a noble, a noble choice, a true yeah. cho uh, choice. Yeah, and I think that one of the things, one of the last comment, in the face of a, the false progressivism that's around, the Holy Father is weaving together the tradition of the church. You look mm -hmm. at the footnotes, this is John Paul II, mm -hmm. and this is Benedict. Benedict, who said that he wanted young people to know that belonging to the church is a set of wings to know Christ that you belong to a community with a future. I think we take the future away from a lot of people. And the poor have no sense of future because they are, are stuck. 
So one of the things that's a real challenge is to hear his call as an educator that he made in Argentina and mixed throughout here is to educate our young people for the call to be those who transform the world mm -hmm. for another possible world. Mm -hmm. To be trans forces of transformation, form them for transformation of another possible world. And while you might just sort of, I know that in the reflections, the sort of dense political thinking that goes on here, that's a teaching to us. Mm -hmm. I think we have abandoned mm -hmm. the forming of our people, our young people, for real political engagement in bringing the gospel of Jesus with its, with its wisdom and its great vision to the life of community shaping in this country. Italy has a great tradition of saints, blessed Giorgio Lapira. I mean, we had a prime minister who's a saint in this century. That is the call from the Holy Father. And there's one more, one thing too. We have a gift in this diocese that we've forgotten, I, I think, a bit, because that's Father Les Paco. Mm. And the mission in Brazil that for 36 years was part of the life of this community. And that connected us really outside of ourselves, giving a concrete vision to what it means to be a Catholic community. And we don't have that anymore. Our linkage now is with our First Nations. Is that enough? Is that enough? I don't know. So maybe we can conclude on that point. Is that enough? And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I come back to uh, one of the points that I mentioned earlier on keeping our feet on the ground, you know, in the place where God puts us versus trying to... Uh, kind of be God when we're not. And so it's kind of reading and hearing in the silence. Okay, where does God focus us? And uh, um, uh, uh, Father Penna mentions, you know, uh, we, we have a priest now, and we have an, uh, an agreement with Kiwait and Lapa that we will provide pastoral support in the Athabasca region. Um, but that outreach to the uh, Athabasca region is also an opportunity for relationship because they minister with us, yes. and uh, and we need them to show us Christ, as, as, and vice versa. You know, so it, that's my my one interpretation of keeping our feet on the ground in the particular community where God puts before us an opportunity to be in relationship, and it, it's new. And I'm really grateful that you cite the legacy of the Brazil mission of the Diocese of Saskatoon. And Father Les Paquin, who is going through his own crucifixion for a long time, continues to do so. And in the midst of his passion, prays for us in the midst of this journey um, and pastoral discernment. So uh, maybe the, the last, maybe because we're pretty much at the end of our time, maybe one way in which uh, the encyclical and our discussion uh, raises a challenge as you see it for our diocese now. Maybe we'll begin with you, Celine. Um, I think for me the biggest point that I heard is is an invitation to take part in difficult conversation um, and not shy away from it. Um, an invitation to challenge ourselves by seeing ourselves through the other's eyes um, in terms of part of the human family. I'm able to appreciate, and you mentioned this at the beginning, sister, but I'm able to even appreciate my own identity more and it is even more of a gift through that interaction. And I'm able to see how I gift myself to the other individual through that. And they are able to see the same through me as I act as a mirror to them as they do to me. And that only can happen if we're willing to put ourselves out there and willing to truly listen and truly take part in this dialogue by finding truth. Um, and to me, it was also an invitation not to silence anyone. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have a tendency perhaps sometimes in this need to secure our bubbles to then basically place opinions on mute. And I think uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's something that we're lacking in our society is this ability to listen to one another. Thank you, Celine. 
A lot, a lot of what you say. Thank you. Father Penna. I, I, Just, you know what, I want to listen to what's Celine, because there is the future. I'm kind of getting... You're not old. that old yet. <laughs> not, not that old, but I'm getting We're the same old. age, aren't we? But here's the thing. Yeah, we are. Okay, there you go. Younger than I am. Huh? But uh -huh. here, look at the good news for me is that look at the wisdom of the old. And one of the things that I think that that is for us to listen to as well, if I might. This man is 83. There's a lot of wisdom here. And we have always tra treasured the clever and the novel. And the culture of dialogue for our diocese now is also about this handing on. We are people of tradition, handing on Christ from one generation to the next. And I think one of the challenges I see is to let those great people who are of a certain age be part of that handing on in our educational systems, in our parishes. Uh, that's one of the, and know that we've only got to walk on part. This is just our moment. And the Lord is coming in glorious power and splendor. And we can glimpse that face as he says, if you, when he, I love the story when he says, when you hear confession, when, when someone asks you for money, he, he says to people, do, do you look them in the eyes? And then, and then he would ask people in confession, they say, yes, Father, I look them in the eyes. He said, and when you look them in the eyes, you hand them money, do, do, do you touch them? And he says, because when you touch them, and in our world it says, don't touch. When you touch them, you're touching the flesh of Christ. Mm -hmm. And when we have that, then you're right, we have to be quiet before the elderly and the young, the, we the wise and the clever, and all of that see the face of Christ. I think the Holy Father would touch even despite COVID. <laughs> yeah, yes. I think he would continue to. <laughs> Sister Marta, one, one way. One, one thing, I think the, the importance um, of acting together where really enable everybody to, um, to get involved, committed, and uh, integrate, uh, but this comes from this conviction, again, really, of belonging to this human family where there is a, a common worth, a common equity, and uh, yes, I think uh, that's the most important thing. I recently arrived, and it was beautiful to cross the ocean, and I felt at home, mm -hmm. living with the sisters of the presentation. Uh, uh, but th that's that's our identity of being brothers and sisters, of, of sharing this uh, open fraternity. That uh, and I think very important for us uh, as priests, uh, as, as religious, as as lay people involved in the church. That uh, says the Pope in in our preachings and catechesis. Uh, really, they need to look forward this uh, social meaning of existence. Uh, and fraternal dimension of spirituality. Mm. That, uh, not to forget that. <laughs> well, thing, maybe maybe I'll I'll venture into. It. There's so yes. many, as you've all said, so many uh, gems in in this encyclical. But um, I've always been intrigued with the call to excellence. Uh, I have because my coaches, my teachers, say, you know, and and it's interesting as 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 we've all grown and as we as we age, some of us more than others, as Father Penn has pointed out. Uh, uh, there's more of an experience of, a, of different lenses on the call to excellence. And the Holy Father holds the bar very high. And not to be too conceptual, but he grounds the universal call to excellence in the particular way we are human. And, and I, I just quote, uh, seeking and pursuing the good of others also implies help, helping individuals and societies to mature in the moral values that foster integral human development. Striving for excellence is what's best for others. And I, I, in my environment, I hear many, especially young people, wanting to be challenged by the call to excellence, yes. and to be all that they can be, and they know that that's about being a gift for others. And uh, so I really appreciate the development of that in the, in the encyclical. There's lots more, as you all shared, uh, to, to, to reflect on, and maybe we'll have a time to do that in the near future. But uh, I thank all of you for being present today and sharing thoughtfully and candidly uh, on these uh, questions and uh, wishing you God's abundant blessings in your education work and your pastoral ministry. And uh, uh, as the rest of your Verbum Dei sisters yeah, arrive okay. to our diocese and embark on a new ministry here. Thank, thank you. you. 
I do thank our panel members for their preparation and sharing their various perspectives and experiences on the various topics. Again, I hope that these discussions are helpful for you in engaging in the encyclical and having further reflection and discussion in your contexts. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you.